So now for the puny, boring magnetosphere. Actually, <laughs> you know, you know the, the hard thing is knowing when to zig and when to zag. So I, I had a few beers with some like-minded magnetospheric physicists this week, and there was an, al an alternative title that was proposed to me, and I, at this point I wish that I had included it. It went something like messenger observations of a planet lacking an ionosphere, colon, a magnetosphere unchained. That's a line, <laughs> that's a line tying uh, joke for anybody that's, uh, that's not into uh, that aspect of MI coupling. So anyway, now we'll hear from the Bantamweight. It's time. Okay, so uh, uh, this, uh, I'm giving this talk, but of course uh, everything I'm going to be showing you is all due to the uh, messenger uh, mission team, and in particular now the, uh, the, the science team. I, I've done my best to uh, note at various places uh, where the charts came from and uh, you know, who provided them. Uh, if I uh, have forgotten somewhere and you're interested, please don't uh, hesitate to, uh, to ask me. Okay, it's true. Uh, Mercury's uh, surface bounded exosphere uh, probably cannot be considered an ionosphere. As a matter of fact, I believe Lammer at some point uh, did uh, actually try to calculate what the height integrated conductance would be. I seem to recall a number something like 10 to the minus 6 Siemens. Now I, uh, I view that though there's just as an opportunity of course uh, to uh, study a unique kind of uh, MI or uh, Plus, uh, magnetosphere planetary coupling, and I hope to develop that as we go along. Uh, this, uh, this picture right here diagram is due to Rosemary Killen, and it of course describes uh, exactly what we mean by a surface bounded exosphere. Uh, these, times, these types of exospheres are very common throughout the, uh, the solar system. Uh, there is indeed no collisional atmosphere. However, from a variety of sources, thermal processes, uh, you know, uh, non-thermals such as uh, sputtering and micrometeorite impact, uh, there's a constant uh, recycling of material up, into, uh, up onto ballistic trajectories uh, which come back down to the surface and they, they stick. Uh, some people describe it as the particles are all, the, the neutrals are always hopping around. Now most of these uh, ballistic trajectories are actually fairly close to the planet. A lot of people don't realize that because they've seen the beautiful pictures from Earth uh, where Mercury has a long neutral sodium uh, tail. However, that represents just a very small fraction uh, of the uh, particles coming off of the surface, the neutrals coming off of the surface, and actually it's just the ones that go up high enough, especially due to solar wind sputtering, uh, that get uh, caught by radiation pressure and eventually get pushed back and, and lost to form that, uh, to form that magnificent tail. Uh, so, uh, the measurements uh, that I'm going to be presenting and the motivation uh, for all of the, the physics does come from the MESSENGER mission. Uh, this is the only uh, plot on the uh, mission that you really need to, uh, the only facts you really need to know, I think. Uh, it's in a near polar orbit, it's 80 degrees inclination, you can think of it as polar. All of the uh, observations I'm going to be showing you from this uh, 200 kilometer by about 15,000 kilometer orbit, they all come from these so-called uh, hot seasons. Uh, it's very important to us, and we call it a hot season, because the periapsis uh, is uh, right underneath the cusp that puts it on, uh, in sunlight. At Mercury, um, we're fighting uh, at, at perihelion 18 suns of solar input. We get nine from the one over r squared of being close to the sun, and then just to add insult to injury, the day side surface of Mercury is so hot, it gives us another nine suns. Uh, as a result, we have a sunshade. Uh, the sunshade does severely restrict uh, the field of view of the plasma uh, instrument, but I will be showing you some of the data, and it's been extremely, uh, extremely important. One last thing, uh, I'd like to walk you through uh, uh, the regions we go through from these, uh, from these hot seasons. They actually are uh, just wonderful, these noon midnight orbits. Uh, uh, for the people who are more interested in magnetospheric dynamics. Uh, we start by going uh, through the uh, magnetopause on the uh, south side of the tail. So we're downstream of the cusp, gives us a measure of the diameter of the tail, how much flux there is in the lobes. Uh, we cross, the, uh, uh, we cross the, uh, uh, the tail current sheet at a distance of about two to three mercury radii. By the way, a mercury radii is uh, 2,440 kilometers. And uh, from some of the measurements that I'll show you, 
this is about where the near Earth, or excuse me, the near Mercury, <laughs> it's hard to break old habits, the near Mercury neutral line uh, normally, uh, uh, normally forms. After that, we dive down closer to the planet. We go right underneath the cusp, uh, usually an altitude, depending upon uh, exactly where we are in the mission, of uh, 200 to uh, about 350 kilometers. And then we do uh, more or less a day-side scan. For those of you in the, in the magnetospheric community, I know uh, Jim Birch and Pat Reif have long advocated uh, trying to get trajectories where you uh, attempt at least, or as nearly as closely as uh, celestial mechanics will allow, to s try to skim the magnetopause. Well, we don't exactly skim the magnetopause, but we're always fairly close to the magnetopause, and we go from the cusp uh, right down to an exit that's usually within like 10 uh, or 20 degrees of the uh, subsolar point. So it's a really nice little, uh, a really nice little orbit. So uh, let's, uh, uh, let's get going. Uh, I'm, my first chart here is probably going to uh, suggest that uh, Melissa may have been uh, not too far from the mark. I'd like to show you a quiet pass. Uh, it would be very nice, I think, uh, maybe for opening a, a student uh, class in magnetospheric physics. Uh, I'm showing you here, I think, uh, it's either, I can't even read the, the numbers from here. This is, a, I believe, 90 minutes of magnetometer data. Uh, we start uh, just uh, north of the uh, plasma sheet out here. We come up over the top of the planet. If you look at the magnetic field data, here it just goes up. You see the really nicely behaved dipole. Uh, you hit a peak there of a little bit over 400 nanoteslas. Mercury's uh, dipole uh, has, uh, gives us about 200 nanoteslas at the equator, as you'd expect, about 400 nanoteslas uh, at the poles. It is, however, offset. Uh, its spin axis aligned, as nearly as we can tell. However, it's offset uh, in the north-south direction uh, northward by about two-tenths of a planetary radius. Uh, so we should be seeing, uh, and we do see, stronger magnetic fields in the northern hemisphere than the south. Here, we, uh, here, if you've got really good eyes, you see a little divot, a little dent in the total field. That's actually the spacecraft going right underneath the cusp. I've just shown a few field lines here from the day side. Uh, that's from the cusp region, that's plasma that's getting in, just a little bit of a diamagnetic decrease. And then we go out through the dayside magnetopause, uh, into the sheath, and through the bow shock. And incredibly boring, right. Well, actually, even here, there's something that's, uh, at least if you, if you look at these kinds of measurements all the time, is extremely unusual. And that is uh, the magnetopause here. It's very clear in the rotation of the field. Here's the north-south component. That's the dipole field right here in the day side. Magnetopause is about half a planetary radius out here. It's only standing off the solar wind about 1,000 kilometers altitude. But look how strong the magnetic field is in the sheath. Uh, you, were showing, uh, you were showing Cassini measurements. Cassini, Cassini there's a usually a little bump here at the shock. It jumps up, field jumps up, and then it falls way down. And it's very, very weak in most passes until you get to the magnetopause. Here, actually, at uh, Mercury, the magnetopause is uh, generally seen uh, as a signature, just the rotation of the field away from the dipole orientation. Now, the reason for this, and it doesn't come as a surprise to us, to us it's basically this Juan Wolf uh, effect. Uh, at Earth, uh, we have a, um, a typical alphanic Mach number that's uh, maybe uh, more like 7, 8, or even 10. Uh, at Mercury, we're looking at an alphanic Mach number that's only three or four. Uh, when the magnetic field uh, uh, goes through the then plasma goes through the shock, uh, the plasma is severely heated. However, as the field lines drape around the planet uh, at the Earth, you get this, you get a thin layer relatively close to the magnetopause uh, where the magnetic field uh, start, the magnetic terms, if you like, in the MHD equation start to dominate. Uh, in fact, the plasma literally gets, uh, uh, literally starts to escape uh, by motion along the field, and you develop what we call a plasma depletion layer. Now, at the Earth, uh, when we get reconnection, these layers are thin enough that the reconnection almost immediately dissipates them. Over here, if you can see the shading, though, this, this region with the depletion layer that's thin blue here, over here at Mercury, it's very thick, and it basically takes up most of the dayside, uh, dayside magneto sheet. So at the Earth, you go through the magnetopause, you see this big jump. At Mercury, usually we see just a change in slope, and actually I'll show you examples here where we don't see any decrease at all. And that's because this uh, depletion layer, basically the plasma has all been uh, escaping. 
Now, I can see you're not wowed by that, uh, but uh, let's let the story continue to build a little bit. Uh, stay with me. Wait for it. Wait for it. Now we're going to start talking a little bit about a favorite subject of many people in the room, and that's uh, magnetic reconnection. And I love this uh, chart. You notice 1974 was a great year uh, for space plasma physics. Uh, the other reason I really like this chart is not only its content, but uh, for the JGR editor and the other editors, boy, back when scientists were scientists. They go, they do their calculation, they draw their graph, and either they label it themselves or they have a grad student with a steady hand. <laughs> and you got your figure. Uh, however, this is, uh, uh, this is actually, I think, one of those, this is Sunrup 1974, this is actually one of those uh, figures that's uh, incredibly Im important. So across the bottom, uh, we have the shear angle of the magnetic field uh, as you go across the magnetopause. Uh, so zero degrees here says that the field outside, uh, elegantly labeled BO for B outside. Uh, so that's the magnetosheath magnetic field. BI is B inside. It was a simpler time. It was a simpler time. Uh, anyway, so this is the ratio of the magnetosheath magnetic field intensity to the magnetospheric uh, field intensity. Now, as we were just saying, at Earth, and even more so at Jupiter and Saturn, you're over here. You're on these curves over here, where the field in the magnetosheath is usually quite weak relative to the field just inside the magnetopause. Mercury, on the other hand, you're out here on these other two curves uh, over here, like. Uh, 0 0.75 to even 1.0. Now, vertically, what Sunnerup is plotting here is uh, reconnection uh, is reconnection rate. He's done it in a clever way. It's dimensionless, and all the physics that uh, MMS is going to discover, all the microphysics, is all in that k factor uh, that's floating up here. But if you like, 1.0 up here is reconnection basically occurring at the absolute maximum rate it could go. Basically, it's uh, everything's going into the diffusion region at the local Alfane speed. Now, uh, at Earth, uh, I grew up at the Earth. You even heard uh, Bob uh, teasing me about uh, doing uh, studies with geomagnetic indices and coupling functions when I was a graduate student. We all grow up with the half-wave rectifier. What's the half-wave rectifier? Basically, you, uh, as far as dynamics at the Earth is concerned, if the magnetic field, uh, 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 the BZ component is... Um, uh, is positive, is northward, uh, that means that the shear angle at the magnetopause is between zero and 90 degrees. There's no reconnection. There's not very much energy input going, maybe a little bit from viscosity or some Kelvin Helmholtz. But basically, uh, uh, this part, half the time, there's, no, there's not that much solar wind input. And then afterwards, you just take this nice slope upward, and you just call it a half-wave rectifier. Uh, if you want to be really sophisticated, you put in a functional form, something like this. Uh, 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 at the, but the reason that the half-wave rectifier is so important at the Earth is because the magnetosheath magnetic field is so weak. As the magnetic field in the magnetosheath starts to become stronger, then all of a sudden it's possible for reconnection uh, for X lines to form, and the actual driving physics behind this is just that if the X line is stationary, you have to be able to supply magnetic flux into the diffusion region from both sides at the same rate. In other words, the V cross B electric fields on both sides have to, have to match. It turns out that when uh, the field outside in the sheath is very weak, basically you can only do that when the magnetic field is almost anti-parallel. But as the fields become uh, equal, then you can have reconnection for arbitrarily uh, small uh, uh, small shears. For example, witness all of the uh, Gosling and uh, Taifan studies of reconnection across the heliospheric current sheet. If uh, anybody you know, is not familiar with the subject, you might have asked yourself, why do we get reconnection at uh, the heliospheric current sheet with only one or two degrees of shear, but at the Earth, I need, uh, uh, I need southward BZ before anything happens? The answer is, across the heliospheric current sheet, uh, the magnetic fields are almost equal in strength. Uh, not to put too much effort into this, but um, this is, uh, uh, these are a couple of days in Mercury that I've been studying in detail. They, occur, uh, they correspond to CME and uh, high-speed stream impacts. This is the kind of anti-parallel or large shear angle reconnection that uh, we're, we're used to studying at the Earth. 
Here's the red IMF. Mercury's, uh, by the way, dipole is the same as the Earth, so southward magnetic field is large shear. And so you get these big kinks in the magnetic field that's been reconnected, and they flow over the two poles. Uh, low shear reconnection uh, is just kinder and gentler. So here you have a dipole field the mag inside the magnetopause is upward. You've got uh, an IMF that's over here. Maybe you've got 50 or 60 degrees worth of shear. And you notice uh, the, the X line splits the two field directions, since they're almost equal in intensity uh, 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 in magnitude. And you just get gentler kinks, and the field tends to have a much larger uh, east-west uh, uh, flow as it goes away, uh, as you go on uh, sideways. Here at Mercury is an example of a disturbed pass, where I think it's going to get a little bit, uh, hopefully a little bit more interesting. At the bottom, we have the field intensity. We have the BZ component of the field. Uh, this is the raw counts uh, for uh, uh, the plasma uh, composition measurement. All of these gold triangles you see are diamonds going up. Those are all sodium plus uh, counts as we go across. This is proton uh, E over Q. For this particular pass, the orientation was such that uh, actually this is fairly low numbers of uh, counts for us. Usually it's much better. Uh, we cannot pull good densities and temperatures uh, out of these. Uh, but again, we're starting up here just a little bit north of the cusp. Uh, uh, this is the cusp in our magnetic field data. You can see all of a sudden now the cusp, we're going from about 450 nanoteslas. Some of these individual, uh, uh, individual decreases, which I call, call filaments, take the magnetic field intensity uh, all the way down to within about uh, 50 uh, nanoteslas of actually zero. Uh, they, uh, they very strongly resemble uh, what I would, uh, what at least a textbook would call uh, Z pinches. Uh, tremendous amounts of hot plasma is flowing down uh, these, uh, these flux tubes uh, from the magnetosheath and the diamagnetic effects are very strong. But you notice how discrete it is uh, all through here. Uh, so uh, high latitude magnetosphere, very, very busy cusp. These filaments, that, as, as we're calling them, continue to be seen for quite a while, all the way down to about 50 degrees. The cusp is up here at a relatively Earth-like, well, a little bit uh, farther north than Earth, but about 75 degrees. And you notice this activity continues all the way through until at mid-latitudes it switches over and we start seeing flux transfer events. And for people who are aware of what the, exactly what those are, I'll talk about them in a minute. And then finally, there's the magnetopause. Look at the magnetopause. Uh, by the way, this line is off by about 15 seconds. It should be right there where the BZ changes. You never see these things until you put them up on a, on a big screen. But look at this. Magnetic field intensity doesn't change at all. And uh, this is one of the, uh, uh, the B normal uh, across, this, uh, uh, across this magnetopause for those that are into reconnection. It's 32 nanoteslas. Uh, at the Earth, uh, at the Earth, an incredibly strong reconnection event uh, will produce maybe a nanotesla or two nanoteslas for B normal. This is actually a weaker than average reconnection uh, event uh, uh, for Mercury. Furthermore, uh, you see all of this reconnection driven activity, and uh, we strongly suspect that these filaments are actually the low altitude mapping of flux transfer events that are occurring up at the magnetopause and opening those flux tubes uh, up to magnetosheath plasma to flow in. Uh, but all this activity uh, is occurring here. And uh, look at BZ. It's northward. The, the shear across the magnetopause here uh, is only about 50 degrees. Uh, why are we getting such a high reconnection rate with um, a shear of only 50 degrees? Uh, the answer is, of course, the low alphanic Mach number, uh, the very, very strong uh, plasma depletion layer. There's actually, for the fields to be equal on both sides, the pressure balance here is basically between B squared over 2 mu naught on one side and B squared over 2 mu naught on the other side. We've got a beta here inside that plasma depletion layer, about 10 to the minus third. So I'd like to move along a little bit now, whoops, that wasn't good, to, the, uh, to some of the, the system dynamics. And uh, I probably am going to run about two minutes or so into my, uh, into my question time. Oh, there it jumped. Uh, very quickly, uh, uh, as I told you earlier, at the Earth, reconnection, very little, less than 90 degrees shear, goes up very strongly as it becomes anti-parallel. 
the scale here, and uh, a scale here is zero to point two. Uh, this is the so-called normalized uh, reconnection rate. You can do it with either V normal over V alphane or B normal over B magnetopause. In MHD, they're both exactly equivalent. Uh, you get this nice arcing up. Uh, Gina DiBraccio over here, paper published last year, one of our graduate students. Uh, here's the result for uh, mercury. We see, re we see strong reconnection for all angles, all the way down literally to one degree of shear. The scale here is zero to, two, is zero to one. All of these events at mercury, they would, if we plotted it to the same scale, they would be over here. Uh, they would be over here for mercury. The reconnection is extremely intense. However, uh, the steady state reconnection that produces these BNs, it's not clear that, that, is act that that's really the dominant uh, driving force for the Dungy cycle at Mercury. Uh, initially, we thought that it was flux transfer events. Susie Imber, one of our team members at Leicester, has actually com uh, completed a detailed study now, or the first detailed uh, study, of the flux transfer events at Mercury. And it does appear that at Mercury, they're probably accounting for about these, these so-called discrete events where multiple X lines at the day side magnetopause uh, form these very large flux ropes. At Earth, uh, these probably only account for maybe 2 or 3% of the total magnetic flux that's transferred or the total energy input. At Mercury, uh, her, uh, her result indicates it's about 30%. Uh, initially, they're so uh, pre prevalent that some of us thought it might be well over 50%. Here's that same uh, actually kind of moderate reconnection day at Mercury I was showing you earlier. Here's the entry into the south lobe. Do you see all this? Those are flux transfer events occurring every 10 seconds with huge amplitude. By the way, you see the fuzz here in the center? That's us going into the plasma sheet, crossing into the north lobe. Those are all uh, plasmoid-type flux ropes. Again, look at the amplitude. Uh, here, of course, is that huge cusp, tremendous, uh, 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 tremendous flow into the cusp. There are the flux transfer events at the magnetopause. Uh, uh, ma plasma sheet crossings are very much what you, uh, what you would expect from Earth. You can see the strong diamagnetism. Uh, the plasma instrument, now that we've uh, got a lot of uh, data from the plasma sheet, has been able to show that about 10% of the uh, ions in the plasma sheet at Mercury are sodium plus. Now, sodium has uh, 23 uh, AMU. Uh, so uh, protons, for example, on average, we have about 8 uh, uh, per cc. We've got something like uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 of sodium plus, but it's 23 AMU. So at least in terms of mass density, this is actually a heavy ion dominated uh, magnetosphere. Uh, so not quite Jupiter, certainly not Saturn, but uh, uh, definitely dominated by the uh, uh, at least in terms of the mass, uh, by the planetary ions, which are just coming from the sunlight uh, shining uh, on that exosphere. The dominant uh, uh, species in the exosphere is, of course, guess what? Sodium. Now, very quickly, the dynamics. If you take the, uh, if you take the, uh, uh, the B normals, uh, the reconnection rates that I was giving you earlier, uh, you wind up with a, a cross-magnetospheric potential during disturbed times that's around 30 kilovolts. Uh, that's, uh, that's towards the high end, for example, of what Tom Hill and uh, George Sisko estimated after uh, uh, Mariner 10. Uh, the difference is basically the very, very high reconnection rate. I think the depletion layers, we didn't quite uh, appreciate that. If you try to calculate the, um, uh, the Dungy cycle, you wind up with about two minutes, something like that. Uh, very often, we see, uh, we see very nice substorm loading and then unloading of the tail. Again, this is magnetic field data, four minutes across. At Earth, we would plot, what, an hour, two hours worth of data. Here we go up in a minute, a minute and a half. Vertical lines, by the way, are traveling compression regions. That's just the signature of plasmoids being released because reconnection started in the tail. You load, reconnection starts, you unload. On some days, uh, you'll see one substorm after another. Again, this is the Bantam weight competition of uh, magnetospheric physics. However, if you've ever uh, watched uh, various athletic events, the Bantam weights are the ones where you see the fastest motion. Uh, if you blink, if you blink, you may have uh, missed the, uh, the, winning, uh, the, the winning shot. And this is very, very similar. At Earth, you can get a very nice substorm uh, with, the tail, uh, on, with the magnitude of the tail field only loading by 10 or 15 percent. These guys right here, these are 50 percent up and 50 percent down. 
We do have a few which look like they're almost going to 100%, almost doubling the flux in the tail. But again, they're two or three minutes each. Here, though, is what we see more typically. And uh, this is extremely interesting. Uh, because I've already pub published uh, uh, a number of examples of the FTEs, 30 minutes, we get 200 FTEs. Uh, they're, they're repeating every uh, 10 seconds. We often see the same thing with plasmoids. Here's a day when we were skimming the, uh, uh, well, we weren't skimming, but we were a little bit above the plasma sheet and hanging there. Here's a couple of proper uh, plasmoids that we hit. Then we were just sitting right over top of the plasma sheet. Every vertical line uh, is a couple of second long plasmoid. Uh, there's about 10 seconds, 8, 10 seconds between each of the events. And they just keep on going off, boom, boom, boom. It almost makes you wonder if you were having uh, flux ropes going one, two, three, four at the dayside magnetopause, and two minutes later in the tail, you've got the plasmoids uh, returning the flux, one, two, three, four. Uh, dipolarizations are going to be discussed in a minute by Larry Kepko. Again, dipolarizations, here's the north-south component. Boom, 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 boom. We often see strings like this where they're quasi-periodic. Repeat times are usually 10 seconds, not much more. Uh, this is where I think I'm going to do a couple of minutes of my, there's only two charts. Uh, but there is something we have at, 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 uh, at Mercury uh, that you really have to go to Ganymede or Europa for uh, if, it, uh, uh, if you're not fortunate enough to be uh, orbiting Mercury. And that is that uh, we do have an opportunity here to, discuss, uh, to uh, in the words of Bob McFerrin, or to paraphrase him, study solar wind magnetosphere core coupling. Mercury is the densest object in the solar system, at least that we know of at this point. Uh, the planetologists talk about it as being uh, somehow this planet uh, formed uh, really with just a, uh, uh, with just a thin crust uh, and a core. And they speculate over collisions or all sorts of interesting scenarios. But we have an iron core uh, that, uh, that, that basically goes from zero, uh, that's basically 2,000 kilometers or thereabouts in radius. So we've got just a, a, a few hundred kilometers of uh, resistive uh, uh, crust uh, sitting on top of a highly conducting core. Uh, it takes about 30,000 to 50,000 years, they estimate, uh, for a change in magnetic field. For example, if the sun just, the solar wind pressure just suddenly uh, went up by an order of magnitude or doubled, it would take maybe 50,000 years for that uh, to be felt in the core. So the skin depths are quite small. So you have a situation where every time the solar wind pressure changes, it's driving currents at one skin depth uh, in, this, uh, in this highly uh, conducting core. So you try to push, uh, you try to compress the magnetopause down to the surface at Mercury, and basically this core just keeps on, these shallow currents basically just keep adding to Mercury's dipole moment. Uh, so Mercury pushes back. Again, the Bantam weight competition here. Now, uh, actually very early as a, as a student, I got interested in this problem, actually before I knew about the induction. And uh, it's uh, uh, because, uh, even without the extremely high reconnection rate that we have now measured, uh, basically you would expect reconnection to sort of slice through uh, all of this magnetic flux in the day side rather quickly. And uh, the possibility of being able to have the solar wind get to the whole surface and uh, sputter it uh, really most of the time uh, uh, was thought to be a real possibility. But what we have is this competition between induction, uh, trying to stand off the solar wind, and shield the surface and the reconnection that's trying to expose it. And uh, so we've gone through and we've picked events like this where we get a CME and it just hits, uh, hits Mercury uh, head on. Uh, uh, we need to be in these new midnight orbits, so so far we've only really found three good examples. Uh, but the people that study the induction, like uh, Karl-Heinz Glassmeyer, they produce these plots where this is uh, ram pressure in the solar wind vertically, and this is distance uh, from the surface of Mercury, or altitude, so here's the surface. This is where the magnetopause usually is, and the solar wind pressure at Mercury is usually around 10 nanopascals. Uh, uh, if you follow the induction curve, though, uh, even to get just down to within two-tenths of a planetary radius of uh, Mercury's surface, you need something like 80 pascals of pressure. You need, uh, you're starting to get really beyond the realm of what of what the sun is believed to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, give us. Long story short, whenever we get uh, these very, very high pressure events, uh, because of the reconnection, and those are reconnection rates, basically we always wind up being far to the left of this no reconnection induction curve. 
And in fact, the, uh, uh, the closest magnetopauses that we've seen to the surface, and we're now down to just a couple of hundred kilometers, uh, those are days when we not only have these high pressures of like 40, 50, 60 nanopascals, but we also have reconnection rates that are about a factor of five to six higher than what we ever see at the Earth. So I'm going to quit there. Uh, you can read that if you like, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. You gave a very nice talk. I learned a lot. OK, yeah. Um, your talk about SANAP is thinking about reconnection. Actually, SANAP also, uh, SANAP and the parchment are also worry about this. SANAP saying, when we observe north in the southward IMF case, in many occasions in Earth's magnetosphere, they see nothing. There's no reconnection. Also, parchment and Typhon reported we, the reconnection has a low beta dependence. They couldn't explain what's going on. So there's, a, if you see the FTE or reconnection driven this uh, mercury uh, aurora, I prefer to say it's arsenic interaction driven that. Because uh, FTE, we can think like a flux tube, like mentioned by Russell Eric. But also, if flux tube picture is not essential. So you think it's a compressional MHD, fast mode wave packet interacts with current sheets, yeah. they produce arsenic wave packet. In this case, the frozen broken locally. <coughs> so the, uh, right now is uh, the, and that's the reconnection rate. If you say reconnection rate, that very tricky because uh, the reconnection rate depends on the local topology, how fast you can remove the plasma too. Mm -hmm. So it uh, also depends on the local force distribution. You compare with reconnection rate, except, except in the very ideal 2D reconnection case, you can repair that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, no comparison. The comparison doesn't give you results. Yeah, I enjoy talk. Okay. I, I, I invite you. Uh, I invite you and everybody, by the way, to uh, to have a look at the Mercury uh, data. It's in the data center. Uh, we could also uh, uh, we could also facilitate your looking at the data if you'd like to apply any of your ideas or models to it. Do we have time for? Yeah, there's another reason why Mercury is such a super efficient reconnector. In addition to the small L thing log number that you emphasized. There's also the fact that Mercury has no ionosphere, Absolutely. Which, which you also mentioned. Uh, and what this means is that there is no saturation effect due to the uh, flow of Birkeland currents. Mm -hmm. uh, and saturation effect is very important in limiting Earth's reconnection potential, and it's, that effect is totally absent in Mercury. That, that's right. If I could just amplify, there wasn't time today. Uh, we see huge amplitude uh, KH. And for exactly the same reason, it appears to, uh, uh, KH appears to form uh, closer to the subsolar point, much, much larger uh, amplitudes, and we think it's uh, the lack of line tying. Uh, so the field line currents, uh, basically, that would oppose, if you like, the wrapping up of the vortices, uh, they die out uh, very quickly. Uh, so again, a mi beautiful miniature magnetosphere, perhaps some people would say unchained, uh, because of the lack of an ionosphere. However, we do have this fascinating coupling to the core. Jim, at the Earth, of course, you were talking about Sonnerup's diagram, and that we have used for years VB South, the half-wave rectifier. Uh, in my presentation, the prediction efficiency, if I use that, is 57%. Uh, if you use VB South to AL. If I go to UCF or the optimum function, I go to 72%. What that really means is that that BY component is extremely important at the Earth in driving activity uh, and uh, accounting for a lot of the variance in magnetic activity. 